recent history has been very interesting. The learning curve for batteries has doubled from about 4% improvement with every doubling of capacity to 8%. 8% starts to be a very significant slope. It's like compounding of interest when you make an investment, right? 8% double the rate actually gets you on a very different trajectory. And that's the, the piece that people have underestimated. By leapfrogging from smartphones into power tools and now into automobiles, and then ultimately from automobiles into grid storage, batteries are going to show up everywhere. When we look at vehicles, the amount of range that we can get out of a battery has gone from 50 miles to now, in the latest cars, it's about 200 miles, 250 miles. The speed is already higher than you can legally go on any highway, so there's no restriction there. Again, it used to be golf cart speed, and now we're talking about race cars. So the last dimension that remains is the cost. Uh, right now, it's still expensive. It roughly doubles the price of the car. But if you project that 8% learning curve forward, and there are very good detailed manufacturing and technology reasons to believe that that's achievable, that improvement basically gets to the point where electrification is a relatively inexpensive add-on option, much like a navigation system or a nice stereo for your car, a couple thousand dollars. And at that point, given the performance benefits, the environmental benefits, the fact that the car is completely quiet, that you accelerate faster, that you consume no fuel when you're stopped at a street light, why not go electric? It's also the integration of that particular product into its ecosystem whole. So we're no longer just designing a car and shipping it. We're actually thinking about the car and the way it interacts, the way it parks. Can it self-park now? Can it interact with parking garages? The way it charges if it's an electric car and there's a big difference between plugging in just when you arrive and actually charging at night. That's a huge difference for the grid. So the car has to behave nicely in order to not bring the grid down and actually enhance the grid rather than diminish the grid's performance. Then also the way we drive, right? Whether it's the basics that we're already all familiar with of having a navigation system or things that are yet to come. We, we've seen the Google car navigate and drive on its own. Those sensors that allow that to happen are as expensive as the car itself today. But they're actually on the fastest cost reduction that I've seen. It's about a 40% learning curve, which means it almost halves with every year. So we're going to have that as a very inexpensive add-on option. And so then that means that the car will have to think about its environment. We'll have to know about pedestrians. We'll have to think about traffic intersections. And so then the kind of systems integration challenge isn't just making the car run, but is actually making the city run. So standard automobile is utilized less than 4% of the time the economics become quite interesting when you can begin to get that utilization even up to 10 percent of the time, no less 20 or 30 percent of the time, which Zipcar and others are able to, uh, to do. So you see the convergence of the Tesla and the electric motor with Google and the driverless car and all the technologies that come with that with the kind of dispatch technologies that Uber and Lyft and Zipcar have and you begin to see a whole different approach to transportation that we're just beginning to see today.